Hello, and welcome to the Say Yes to Holiness podcast. I'm Christina Simmons, your host, and I have a return guest today, Dave Plisky, and I am really excited because the last time that we talked, uh, it was about the results of the work that you've done, um, you know, calling it a survey, I always think is, is less than, uh, but it was a real serious study uh, that was done about intentional discipleship, um, and um, I'm just glad that we have a chance to be able to connect because you're continuing to work with those results and and do some work so dave welcome back to the podcast thanks so much for having me christina it's great to be here uh well you know it's something where uh i was so excited to see this new initiative and we'll get to that in a second that came out of the study that we talked about last time in fact if people want to go and listen to that it's episode 153 now that i'm done with the shameless promotion um i was wondering uh, in the interim, uh, how has uh, your work, continued work with the study results, how has that had an impact upon you personally and your own faith journey? Oh, it's a good, it's a great question. Um, I appreciate the question. So when the, when we first conducted the study, I did not yet have a spiritual director. Mm. Uh, and, um, and so I, I have to admit that, you know, this, Part of I think part of the study and 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 the importance that spiritual direction seems to play in the, in the uh, the life of a disciple was part of I think the Holy Spirit writing that on my heart that it is time for a spiritual director. Um, in fact, I had a <laughs> I had a confession once with a priest who uh, after our like you know his little co- conversation at the end. He's like, you know, you need a spiritual director, and I was like, I know, like I, I've been, yeah, I've been looking for one for like a year, uh, and I was like, are you? Does this mean you're offering? And he's like, uh, let me know if you can't find one, which is, I think, so many people's, you know, issue with that. But yeah, so um, I did, I did end up finding one, and she's wonderful, and it's definitely uh, changed my my life. Um, mm. Definitely been able, yeah, I to to have someone who is so spiritually mature guide me in recognizing how God is working in my life is, I mean, what a, what a blessing. There's nothing, Mm. there's nothing like that. Amen. Um, I was blessed uh, throughout my entire journey. Um, You know, so I'm going back to 1989 of where I've had spiritual directors, not constantly, because there were gaps, you know, and I would have to go look and search. And so I, I feel your pain, you know, for that year search. Um, but yeah, I, I can totally attest to, I have been blessed by so many uh, men and women who, as you said, a mature disciple, someone who's farther along the path than I am. And they're able to point out and go, hey, you know, so I'll, I'll, you know, this usually wasn't what was said to me, but this is, you know, where I'm kind of going, hey, stupid, right there <laughs> is the answer to what you've been asking God. And he's been trying to tell you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like you said, hopefully it's a little more gentle than that. But yeah, uh, yep. that, is, that is so important. No, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Call, calling us to see what we're not already seeing about mm-hmm. how God is already working in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, totally. Um, so I'm so glad to hear that. Um, and it's always wonderful to hear how people continue to grow on their own journey. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why I love doing this podcast is to be able to help others know, hey, just because you're not where you think you should be, or you think you should be farther, or you know that you think you've made it, it's like, no, you still got a lot of growth to go. Uh, and it's going to be one we do all the way until the very end. Um, right. So, uh, but I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So um, the study itself, you know, mm-hmm. could you remind everybody if they're not going to go and listen to episode 153, could, <laughs> could you remind them, you know, what the survey was all about? Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we, like you said, we did, I, so let me back up. So, so I work for an organization called the sales media. And we are interested in helping to form disciples. Uh, we, we work out of uh, the Diocese of Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And I come from a marketing background. Um, and so I think about um, what we call the, the marketing funnel, which is sort mm-hmm. of like representative of, and I know I talked about this last time, 
that representative mm -hmm. of that idea that you know fewer and fewer people uh, actually move towards purchasing a product, becoming a loyal customer, and ultimately what we really want is a brand advocate, someone who can't help but talk about this brand or product to all their friends and family. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that sounds just like an intentional discipleship. That's what a missionary disciple does. And so if that's the case, then, then we then we can see uh, that you know that's who's having that's who's bringing people into the church into the quote top of the funnel, so to speak. Um, if that model is right, then we wanted to know the answer to the question, what are the unmet needs of intentional disciples? Because if that's who's doing the work of evangelization, then let's, then fi let's find out how to equip them. And like any good marketer, I don't, want to, I don't want to assume that the rest of the world is just like me, and I don't want to rely on my hunches. So we wanted to make data-driven decisions. And because we're all one church, we didn't want to just hoard this data uh, and these findings, we wanted to make them available to the to the wider world, um, both you know to people who are looking to advance their own spiritual journey for themselves, as well as people who work in ministry who might be guiding the lives of others at whatever capacity, whether it's uh, you know in a parish, in a diocese, or even in, in some kind of other ministry. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely, and that was a part of what drew me to it, um, is because one of the biggest things that I'm always looking for is data driven, um, you know, uh, you know, information to help be able to then get a little bit better about uh, that uh, work that brings people into the funnel. Uh, Holy Spirit takes care of it when it gets in, when the person's in the funnel. Um, but uh, one of the things that I have found is that if I'm being attentive to assessment, to metrics, to, um, you know, balancing and saying, you know, so one of my favorite, um, you know, tools I love to use is a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, and I look at threats as challenges um, of any type of event or any type of activity ministry that is being done. And then assessing that. So that was a part of why I was like, hey, here's here's someone who is trying to say, what are the unmet needs? What are we That's missing? Right. And so I was real excited about that. So as you said, last time we discussed the results of the study, you know, right. um, itself, but now there's a new initiative that's developed. Could you tell right. me a little bit about that religion to reality webinar series? Kind of yes. how it came about. Right. So, so um, last time I was on, we were talking about, you know, we kind of unpacked some of the initial findings that we released in the overall report, which is still available to download, by the way, you can mm -hmm. get that at desalesmedia.org slash uh, discipleship. Um, and by the way, I will be making some shameless plugs myself throughout the episode. So Absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, in it, you know, some of the key takeaways, for example, around evangelization, since we talked about that, was that, you know, um, so again, this is a study of only mass attending Catholics in the U.S. So mm -hmm. we were trying to, to understand. So so we learned that, you know, uh, while 80% of them are, say that they're comfortable sharing the faith, only 50% of them actually do share their faith, like 52%. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned what their barriers to evangelization were. We learned that thankfully, a good 76% of them are interested in going deeper in their faith and learning, you know, uh, going, going through formation to understand how to evangelize better, uh, share their faith more more effectively, and be more comfortable doing so. So there was there was some kind of good takeaways there. We also learned, you know, I think twenty percent of people uh, were currently receiving spiritual direction. We learned about people's uh, life in in their com like spiritual communities, their use of spiritual apps and other digital kind of faith aids and things like that. So this was kind of the 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 scope of the work. I was left thinking at the end of that uh, two things. One where are people in their spiritual maturity? And two, are there, so, so, so to just go, just to unpack that a little more, uh, meaning, you know, is, uh, to use Sherry Weddell's thresholds of conversion mm -hmm. language, like wait, how, 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 like, we wanted to know about the, the life of disciples. And my, my question was, did we, or did we actually just find out <laughs> the life of people who, who go to mass, but then who knows what their spiritual life is like the rest of the week, let's say. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other question was, are there correlations we can draw between the answers to different questions? So for mm -hmm. example, we know, um, how, how, how many of these people receive spiritual direction. We know, uh, which of them, uh, uh, let's say are praying every day of the week. Is there a correlation between prayer and spiritual direction and mass mm -hmm. attendance and so forth? Those were the two kinds of new reports that we're publishing. 
and we're and we're unpacking that through a webinar series that we're calling Religion to Reality. So that's all at religiontoreality.org. And the reason we called it that is because of that idea I was just mentioning, the idea that if someone is happily or you know for whatever reason going to mass on Sundays, you know, at, either out of duty obligation, hopefully joy, possibly social status, whatever it might be, but then not participating in the other aspects of the life of a disciple, they must, they, they in some way are living a compartmentalized life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, mm -hmm. like I, I used to use the term spiritual life, compartmentalized spiritual life. I'm now realizing that's kind of the whole problem. If we can, we don't have a spiritual life, we just have a life. And mm -hmm. what we want is to have an integrated life. And so the, the, the goal of religion to reality is to try to help people to decompartmentalize and just live an integrated life, you know, mm -hmm. spiritually. Ah, oh, gosh, uh, you just in that one sentence right there. If our, you know, whoever's listening, um, if you were to just take that one statement about the fact of not having a compartmentalized life, but having an integrated life, and that our spiritual life isn't that, it isn't something that's separate, but rather it is. Um, and to go and meditate upon that uh, with our Lord, um, wow, <laughs> that, that's some great stuff right there. Um, so striving to have that integrated life, you're doing this webinar series, uh, taking some of the results from the study and being able to see how they're kind of cross-correlating um, you know, and how, how they're interacting. Um, what are you attempting to do with each session? Because yeah. each one is on a different, different result or a different observation, you know, that came, you know, from Correct. the study. Yeah. The study was pretty wide reaching. I think that's why we were able to go back to that same data set and pull so many more insights out of it. Uh, and so we realized, okay, this isn't going to be able to happen all in one session. So we, the first one is an overview of kind of bringing the two together, giving the context of the previous study, and then kind of shining a light on uh, the, 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 the main findings, let's say, of the two new, the two new reports that we have. Um, following that, each of, the, each of the, the next five sessions goes deep on a particular topic that we, that we learned a lot about. So the, first, the, the next one being spiritual direction, and then we talk about uh, technology and faith, and then growth and faith, and then community, and finally, generational differences in discipleship. So trying to, you know, recognize that people are going to gravitate towards uh, towards certain ones more than others. Um, mm -hmm. And also that, you know, the people who we have as guests on the podcast, uh, sorry, on the, on the webinar, rather, uh, are going to be able to speak uh, better to certain things. So we tr we're trying to get guest experts that are able to kind of really unpack this. So for example, on the spiritual direction episode, we had Father Boniface Hicks and Dr. Greg Popchak, both who, of whom are coming from kind of different areas of the spiritual direction world, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. but still, uh, I think, able to give a lot of insight. And so to try to to try to take, I what I wanted to do is lift the lift the findings off the page, not to keep talking about exactly what the what the insight was, but then like how are we how are we seeing that in the world in in this in this um, particular mm -hmm. discipline within discipleship and. How are, how, you know, how can we apply that in our own lives or mm -hmm. ministries? Yeah, I, I absolutely love that because one of the biggest, um, you know, observations, not criticisms, but just observations of especially American Catholicism, and I, I've been just as guilty of this, is the fact that we'll dive in and we'll learn about something, mm -hmm. but then we have all this head knowledge mm -hmm. and we don't go and integrate it. Uh, into our lives in a practical way. So the fact that you're attempting to be able to give people practical applications and being able to help them be able to take this information about the study and being able to apply it, I, I absolutely love that. That That's great. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, for example, um, we, we are in the process of so I work in technology uh, within DeSales and, and we, we have been equipping parishes and schools with the right technology kind of to modernize communications basically uh, uh, for, for years now, for I mean, 10 years, let's say, um, and, and trying, to, trying to kind of build that digital infrastructure so that they can do, uh, you know, 
that important work of formation on top of it, right? If we think, if we kind of, if we can consolidate the, 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 the process of spiritual maturity or the life of a disciple down to a simple formula of invitation, commission, uh, sorry, invitation, formation, commission, then, you know, trying to do that formation work. So we need, you need something to, to, for it to sit on top of, you need to be able to actually reach people when you're trying to, when you're trying to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we're, as we think about, you know, how to bring formation in a bigger way to, in, into certain, um, you know, parishes we want to work with in the diocese, um, mm -hmm. recognizing that spiritual direction needs to be a part of that. We want, we want to, we want to make sure that we're, um, able to, to offer spiritual direction to, uh, the individuals who are going through these transformational, you know, kind of events, uh, and, and mm -hmm. hopefully new processes, new ways of working. And, uh, we, I, I've seen that in action in the diocese of Charleston, um, uh, I think earlier this year, they announced a, a new initiative where they've actually launched a spiritual direction department or, or an office or whatever they call it, um, where they're where they're making, you know, I think 60 something uh, spiritual directors available to the faithful of the diocese. And that's mm -hmm. that's a that's an, a massive initiative. I think it's it's wonderful to see that. Yeah. So it, so it's great to see these kind of beacons of hope and people are, who are taking this and, and, and running with it. Absolutely. That actually, you know, the example that you just shared um, was one of the questions that we had had in our last conversation about, okay, so who is it that needs to be putting together these resources, you know, so that people can find spiritual, you know, directors, for example, and, you know, is it a diocesan level, is it a parish level, et cetera. And I think it, I think it's a, a both and, you know, on, on my part. Um, but uh, one of the uh, big things I did want to ask was what have been some of the takeaways from these conversations that have already occurred because you're midway through and by the time this comes out, there'll be another three uh, that are coming up and there's total of six, but um, you know, am I right on that? There's six, not five. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, so uh, what are some of the takeaways or things that um, you should, you know, just to point people towards, you know, you brought up about Father Boniface Hicks and the yeah. spiritual direction. Um, what were some other takeaways that you would want people to know about? Father Boniface uh, made an interesting point when we were talking. He he said, you know, let's not forget that that spiritual direction is a relatively new thing. Uh, it just mm -hmm. in terms, at least in terms of it being a a um, widespread thing, a popular thing. He mm -hmm. said. As recently as 60 years ago, this was not really a common thing at all, even among the presbyterate and and mm -hmm. uh, and religious. Um, he, he said he said anyone in seminary would have a spiritual director, but not necessarily after that. And right. it sounds like to me it wasn't really until you know Vatican II and the universal mm -hmm. call to holiness that we start to see uh, a, you know the, a, an appetite, a pe particularly among the laity, uh, but also among clergy and religious. Uh, for mm -hmm. it. So I thought that was really um, a kind of an interesting point where we are, I, I think it underlines how much of Vatican II we still have yet to implement. You know, oh, there's yeah. so much there, uh, you know, that is that is ripe for the taking of the church. And it was so prophet prophetic. But, you know, we <laughs> we evolve very slowly. We, <laughs> we mm -hmm. take things in time. So um, but yeah, so that I thought that was interesting um, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the in terms of the audience members. Um, there was an incredible amount of engagement on that episode. People, um, I guess it was mostly two camps of people, either people who were who were wondering about the discernment of of finding a spiritual director and how to find mm -hmm. a spiritual director, or people wondering about the discernment of becoming a spiritual director and how to become a spiritual director. Mm -hmm. So that was really interesting and encouraging to see, okay, we really are reaching people from across the board, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, wherever people are on their own journey um, and uh, our Lord speaking to them. I know that, uh, for example, if people aren't aware of Dan Burke and spiritualdirection.com, I mean, that's where the entire apostolate, which is now the Avil Institute, you know, got its start, was on an trying to answer this exact question of how do I go and find a spiritual director? Um, yeah. And, you know, and understanding where we normally are in our spiritual life about when that is going to start happening and for us to be aware of it. And I think it's important for us, especially for those of us who are the intentional disciples who are making that invitation, you know, to people to kind of, you know, jump into that funnel, as you were talking about, mm -hmm. is that not everybody is ready for that yet. That's true. 
That's yeah. true. And it's something of where there's particular things that we need to help others, you know, be attentive to, you know, so I would, I would, you know, uh, kind of say that, you know, a consistent prayer life and frequenting the sacraments is going to be, you know, happening, you know, or at least you're leaning towards that before you're going to go, you know, I probably need some help with this, <laughs> with this whole I, spiritual thing. <laughs> agreed. And, and, uh, that's, and then in fact, um, once you kind of reach there, uh, what the study shows is that um, they kind of bolster one another. So uh, mm -hmm. spiritual direction, I, we, I can't say directionally, but there is a correlation between spiritual direction and uh, prayer and mass attendance. It's you, you're more, the more someone is um, attending spiritual direction, the more they are likely to attend mass more than once a week and the more likely they are to pray every day of the week. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they, they certainly uh, complement one another. Yeah. Another thing that we found that that is really fascinating is that a hundred percent of the people who uh, who who reported as currently receiving spiritual direction said that spiritual direction was available in their home parish or in a community to which they belong. Now, mm. I will say that given how crazy it is to 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 see a stat that is a hundred percent statistically significantly a hundred percent. Uh, is wild. So I will, I will, I will allow that some people maybe didn't really know what we were talking about when we talked about spiritual direction. They maybe thought mm -hmm. about just kind of informally talking to their priest about spiritual things, and that's fine. Um, but that that isn't what we meant. So okay, granted, maybe some of these people were were misinformed, even though we tried to define it in the in the in the language of the study. That being said, that still tells us something very important, which is mm -hmm. one. <laughs> uh make pe make it available because people will will take advantage and two people will not really look for it much outside of the spiritual the the um faith kind of circles that they already uh mm -hmm. f like kind of are in All right um, yeah now i i'd say that end of that you know um observation that insight is actually the key the, you know, that goes to the work that I've been doing, you know, with the Catholic leadership puzzle, which is the reality that our leaders, whatever, you know, and it's not you're paid necessarily, but it could be leading the rosary group. You know, the fact is, is that they're not going to know how it is that they're supposed to be attentive to helping people continue on their journey if they haven't experienced it, if they're not aware of it. Um, and I, I think that's where, you know, creating a parish where people understand what is our true mission. And our true mission is to share the good news so that we can save souls and also so that we are able to grow in holiness. And by doing that, we're then going to transform the world around us in our local community um, in ways that we couldn't even imagine, but that's the natural way of it. And that's mm -hmm. why we're all called the holiness. I mean, so you're talking Vatican II and, um, you know, you said, Hey, it was so prophetic. And I want to remind people, you know, when something is prophetic, that means it's going to come to about, you know, it's not already happened, but rather it's beginning to unfold. And um, I uh, best definition I ever got a discernment was that it's God's unveiling of his plan for your life. So as you, as we're discerning, if something's prophetic, we kind of have a glimpse of it, but we don't know how we're going to get there. And that's where discernment comes in. And therein, you need a spiritual director, both personally and also within community. Um yeah. You know, but how, how many communities do we know are actively, intentionally discerning what the particular mission is that God has entrusted to their community? Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's you, you, in your book, you mentioned the, the, the soul of the apostolate uh, mm -hmm. and, and how important, you know, that 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 discernment is, you know, we prayer has to proceed action. You know, we mm -hmm. have to understand we have to contemplate God's will for us. So that we can carry it out. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, you also mentioned something earlier that I, you, you mentioned, you know, we, we bring that, we bring them into the church and then we let, the, we let the Holy Spirit take, you know, take over. I, I agree that the Holy Spirit has a big part of it, but I don't think the work is done. I think, oh, absolutely. You're yeah, correct. I, yeah. I think, I think the, the worker for me, you know, the difficult, but I, I, I mentioned this because I feel like a lot of, a lot of, the, the posture of a lot of Christians is that, uh, well, 
you know, when it comes to sowing the seed, where let's just go chuck a bunch of seed and ho- mm-hmm. and and we'll we'll see where it falls and we'll Shotgun. let God take care of it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, but that's the easy part. If you know, yeah. if that was how farming worked, everyone would grow their own food. But the mm-hmm. reality is, tilling the soil is the hard stuff, yeah. and that is what we're talking about when we talk about formation, and that mm-hmm. is what we are also called to do. To be, you know, yeah. uh, as the as the USCC put it, uh, co- uh, co-workers in the vineyard. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, totally. Um, the fact that we must continue to accompany. Um, and, you know, so what I have seen, you know, the general is, hey, I get them. They get their sacraments. Now I'm done. And again, it's that whole thing. No, we continue to accompany. We continue to build friendship. We continue to walk with them. Uh, it's not like, hey, suddenly, you know, we're we, we don't, we no longer have a responsibility and we get to abrogate it, you know, um, and say, Oh, you know, I'm done. Um, let me but, ask you a question that's somewhat related sure. to what you were just saying, but it not, not exactly related to the study, but I was, you know, I was talking to someone recently and, you know, what do you think is happening with the fact that so many, uh, young, young, um, parents want to get their kids baptized. And so they have them baptized but these people don't necessarily go to church all that often or maybe at all. Mm-hmm. And then a high percentage of them still are interested in having their kids receive Holy communion. And so they might have their kid, you know, re- take, take part in religious education, still not going to mass. Mm-hmm. And then, and then everything drops off after that as if, right. as if either a, it was all about the sac. Like it's just kind of this, like gamification, leveling up till you get the sacrament. Little but magic then, fairy dust, but not confirmation for whatever reason that gets left out. Mm-hmm. What what's going on there? Um, well, I'm glad that you're seeing, uh, you know, people still wanting to baptize their kids because what we're seeing is is that it's kind of like a you know, we, we're not worried about it, um, you know, and uh, in fact, it, it's one of the great concerns. Um, but I I, uh, I kind of smile because I'm like, hey, at age seven, they are now considered an adult in the eyes of the church. And if, you know, little Johnny raises his hand and says, hey, I want to be baptized, he can get baptized without mom and dad, you know. <laughs> so I, I love how Zoom just, uh, you know, figured that I, because I was raising my hand that I needed to have a, a hand icon on my screen. I love uh. that. <laughs> you know, and thank you, AI. Um, yeah, right. But anyway, um, so I think what's going on, honestly, is that it's the continued vestiges of it's almost a cultural, um, you know, uh, you know, faith of where I know it's important, but I have no clue why. But my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, you know, my parents, everybody is saying I need to get my kid baptized and they need to get first communion. Part of the reason why the confirmation piece drops off so significantly is because people do not understand it. One is that we ha- you know, we need to restore the order. And I know that this will bring up all sorts of things, um, you know, but if we restore the orders of the sacraments of initiation so that at age seven, you know, turning eight, you know, so when we celebrate First Communion, will have celebrated also confirmation. So in other words, they'll receive baptism, confirmation, first, you know, first Eucharist in the proper order. So they're fully initiated. And then you have that opportunity to truly evangelize the families and be able to continue to work with them so that then they are going to mass. They are, you know, living it out. Um, And the fullness of what the Holy Spirit desires to, you know, all the graces and gifts, they're already present and then they can be unboxed. I know that that's huge. And I, I would be one of these people from, uh, you know, probably not even a decade ago. And I would be saying, no, nah, we probably need to, you know, to keep these kids around. Otherwise we'll lose them. And what we're seeing is, is that the statistics don't bear it up. Is the statistics are, is that, the kids have already checked out by the time they're 11. They're, they're already gone. They've already mentally checked out. Even if they show up and they go through confirmation, they're they're checked out. They've already kind of disassociated from religion, from the faith. Yeah. So 
Therefore, the argument is restore the sacraments, you know, of initiation to where, what they originally were and what we do with our OCIA for kids as well as for adults and give the fullness of the sacraments and then be intentional about evangelizing in those moments and then continuing to accompany and to form. So you really dive deep with your third, fourth, fifth graders, your upper elementary and your middle school, and you do it within family context. Um, and then, then you're able to do that. But I think that's a part of what's going on is that you're seeing vestiges of a cultural understanding of this is what we do. And so we get our kids baptized. And so I'm in a, a predominantly Hispanic community and those celebrations are all about the party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all about the party. It, yeah. It's all about the dress for first communion, you know, for the young right. ladies. Um, but it's all, it's all about the party. It's not about the sacrament. And that's definitely not unique to Hispanic communities, by the way. No, yeah. I, I, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't have an opinion on restored order. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I could see the logic. I, you know, I'm okay with it either way, but, um, I don't think that that just suddenly solves the problem. I don't think no, it doesn't solve it at all. Is confirmed is going to make the, the 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 family start attending mass. Mm -mm, you know? mm -mm. So, no, no to totally agree with you on that. It doesn't solve the problem, but I think what it does is that it begins to part part of what is going on and and part of the argument for like a restored order is that we get the disorder out. And that's usually what we struggle with most in all of our lives is we are disordered. We have something that is taking the precedence of what we should be about. And what should we be about with everyone, regardless of where they are in their journey? And it's about continued evangelization, continued invitation, continued formation, and continued you know, commissioning to go out at whatever point they are at that, at, at that point. Um, and we forget that it's not about, oh, I graduate, you know, because when we keep kids longer, it becomes associated with graduation and then they check out, you know, so um, you're thinking but, that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you're thinking that by, by, um, confirming them earlier on, they will then have the, the power of the Holy spirit in them to evangelize their own family. And that that's will... a piece of it, but it, it it's it, it's simultaneously the parish isn't just about hey let's make sure we get these kids their sacraments, but rather we're evangelizing the family simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So, like for example, and we're trying to do this in our parish of where uh, we don't have drop off. The mm -hmm. parents are in formation as sure. at the same time as the kids are. Um, because of the situation that, that we are in, we had determined that we do two years of formation, but it's only the first year that we mandate, quote unquote, that the parents, you know, are on campus. And what we do is that we take them through Alpha, and there's other there's other programs that are Alpha's out there that work yeah. just as well. But we take them through Alpha to make sure that they have had that encounter with Christ. Then we go through, it's a shortened version of the uh, understanding the mysteries of the Bible, which is you know, the great, uh, you know, timeline, you know, the Bible timeline. So giving them the great salvation history context. And then we finish with the importance of the mass and its rootedness in scripture and tradition. So what we're hoping is that by the end of that time, that the parents are going to personally have, you know, cemented or had an encounter or deepen their encounter with Christ, giving them the encouragement to continue on their own journey in the midst of understanding how they have a part to play in the larger, you know, larger uh, story of salvation history and why it's so important to be coming to mass. Mm. If you have a family that is coming to mass, then you continuously have that opportunity for the Holy spirit to be working. But then also it's that opportunity for us to be able to continue to encounter and engage with them. But it's got to be a simultaneous. It can't be, oh, just get them, you know, as you said, doesn't solve it and totally agree. Yeah. But rather it's a combination of, okay, let's ensure that they have their sacraments in the process. We're evangelizing the family and then we're empowering families to go and to evangelize and to bring yeah. others. 
I think I think what I'm excited about is so I I love Alpha. That's one of the that's one of the players that we've identified that we want to be doing more with when it comes mm-hmm. to bringing formation resources into parishes and school contexts. Uh, another one is the Catechetical Institute from Franciscan University at mm-hmm. Steubenville. Mm-hmm. Their uh, Franciscan at Home um, online platform. formation mm-hmm. platform, exactly. And what what I like about that, and the reason I'm bringing it up is, you know. Yes, it's good to it, the two years that you're talking about sound excellent, but then what, right? What mm-hmm. what does the formal formation program look right. like, or ongoing processes? Really, is what I what I want to be talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, as as James Clear mentions in his book Atomic Habits, like mm-hmm. we have to do identity level stuff, not behavioral level stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So so changing our processes, which is the way we are and work, mm-hmm. rather than the just a thing that we happen to be doing. So. Uh, that's what I love about you know something like Franciscan at Home because now people can be journeying, accompanying one another, journeying together, in really a never-ending way. You know there are, mm-hmm. there are so many tracks of content that take so long, but so much rich- richness I think that 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 hopefully comes out in dialogue in those small groups that they that they recommend for people to do it in the context mm-hmm. of that mm-hmm. uh, that hopefully you know both 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 uh, younger people and and their parents can continue to journey, you know, into mm-hmm. deeper to the faith. Yeah. One, one of the things that we have used and put it on your radar is families of faith from the Sophia Institute. Um, I think something, you know, it's not a perfect, you know, program, you know, uh, but it, it has the, the, the aspects that we're looking for, which is for the family to be able to grow together and to get to know other families if we're able to create that small group. So often when we create small groups, we do it by age or we do it by, you know, uh, interest or, you know, stage of life, but we separate out the family and it's just like, no, we need to learn how to integrate, um, homeschooling. You know, I'm not saying you got to homeschool your kids. I'm just saying homeschooling families get how to do this. Mm. You know, they come together, uh, you know, so you have homeschooling co-ops and stuff like that, you know, is a perfect, you know, example of what, but they're praying together and they're socializing together and then they're breaking off of their formation, which is appropriate for the particular ages and, and you know, who's, who's being formed. But yeah. it's this entire concept of being together, you know, out in, in and around that. And what we tend to do with small groups is we tend to just do the formation only and not be doing the prayer and the socializing all together. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that's a that's a huge piece of what we have to be trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'm interested because you've got nurturing faith and community and generational differences and discipleship coming up as your as your next three. And yeah. I'm wondering, are you going to be getting into this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, so uh, so the, we can go all over the place. Um, you know, Growth and faith. I mean, the, the key takeaway here is that uh, bringing people into encounter with the Lord actually works. You know, mm-hmm. when when we did this study, we asked, "What are your, what what does your discipleship journey look like?" Uh, and we asked, "Is it mostly a long, gradual path? Is it mostly a series of kind of uh, you know big events that uh, you know, inspiring, life changing events, or a mix of both?" Most people mm-hmm. said it's a mix of both. And right. when we asked about the effects of that. What we learned is that, you know, um, actually one of the, one of the really, um, lower areas of strength. So not a, not so much an area of strength for most uh, people is going on retreat. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, 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 that makes sense, right. When you think about, um, I don't know, just someone's vacation schedule, let's say, Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I mean, the average American family, I think tries to get away for some kind of uh, vacation, be it, you know, whether it's just relaxing on a beach or going to take a trip somewhere new or whatever it is. But I think that we give short shrift to, to just spending that, that stillness, that silence, that mm-hmm. contemplation time with, with the Lord, as mm-hmm. we were talking about before, wondering what he's up to in our lives and what he has in store for us. I mean, n- nothing gets closer to the heart of that, uh, than, than, than really kind of dedicated time, um, mm-hmm. uh, with, with that to be able to to be able to sit with that so um huge recommendation i have i guess for for someone whether you're again uh just an individual looking to um live an integrated spiritual life uh, an integrated life rather see it's i'm still learning mm-hmm. myself getting away from yeah this. or that you are leading others uh in that way um 
make make retreats uh, more more of a thing for for yourself and for others. You know, I bet you there's a retreat center closer than you realize. And that's part of the problem, by the way. They're really hard. They're hard to find. They're hard to kind of figure out. They don't have good online. They don't businesses. market well. <laughs> no, no, they don't. <laughs> I honestly think that if someone came in and here's a little plug, if you want to do a side project with me about trying to do the Airbnb of uh, retreat houses, I'm in. <laughs> I think oh. this is. I think this is a real. I don't know if it'll be a huge money maker, but I think it'll make a big difference for people to make them to make yeah. it more available, uh, and as mm -hmm. as well as to make it. Um, not, not just to know like where they are or that they that they have uh, availability, but that they actually are um, doing. You know, there's a lot. You don't you know, you don't just have to go to a, a retreat uh, house and and spend time by yourself. There's guided retreats that are made for for couples or for families or whatever your situation might be. So um, yeah, I I can't I can't stress that enough. Uh, I, I would absolutely love to see something like that. Um, you know, the, the benefit would just be, uh, wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Um, so to bring it back, you know, to your uh, religion to reality series, um, what, what is, what's your great hope, you know, that might come from this project, you know, and why, why should people participate? Yeah, I hope that people uh, find inspiration through some of the um, guest experts and some of the insights that we're trying to provide, um, that they feel inspired to actually uh, improve their own lives and the lives of others uh, through through paying attention to some of the overlooked aspects of of our life as a disciple, um, and also to to find others like them. Right, we're trying to bring people mm. into community. So. Um, mm. That you know, there's there's some form of community in the fact that there's a webinar where we're gathered live, or you know, if we, you can of course uh, look back at the 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 recordings of the ones that came before. But trying to bring people into a space where they, they have a common interest in this stuff. Following the webinar series, religion to reality will become a podcast. Uh, so mm -hmm. so that will be uh, an additional exploration, and and we we're we're thinking critically about how we can bring people. I I don't like to over I don't like to use the term community uh too flippantly <laughs> i think it, mm -hmm. i think it actually means something and it's and it's it's i feel like the definition is becoming a little warped as as different um i don't know online technology sort of take hold of it right like yeah. we, we now think of you know someone who someone who uh does social media promotions in a marketing department is called a community manager you know right. we, we so, like we a lot of people refer to to a community as anyone who happens to be watching a video that they put out, even mm -hmm. if they don't ever talk talk to one another or know who. Yeah, you know, right. I don't think that's a community. <laughs> so right. we are trying to figure out exactly what it looks like to to bring uh, people like you and and you know, I think your listeners into mm -hmm. uh, something together because we want to be we, we have to journey together. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the message of Pope Francis uh, and and the synod on synodality and everything he everything he's about is resonating very deeply with me, which is we've got to journey together in this. Mm -hmm. So the more we can come together and, and do that work, I think the better, the stronger we are. Amen. I totally agree. Uh, one of the things that I would love to, uh, to see, uh, kind of like your Airbnb for retreats is, um, you know, especially with this Jubilee year, you know, getting ready to launch is making pilgrimages, you know? And so it's kind of like, want to make a pilgrimage? Here you go, you know, kind of the same thing, you know, it's like mm -hmm. you can go here, you can do this and being able to bring people together. Um, I know that, you know, they have pilgrimage tour, you know, companies, that kind of thing. But what I'm thinking of is the, oh, you want to go and here we go. Here are your different opportunities of things that are going on. So again, a clearinghouse kind of, you know, um, yeah. you know, because pilgrimages are just like retreats. Uh, they're absolutely transformative. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, that can be done in a very kind of lo-fi way, right? Mm -hmm. As a parish or as a diocese, actually the Diocese of Brooklyn do, uh, does an annual uh, Lenten pilgrimage where we're, where you know, we invite uh, parishes to participate. I think we had over 30 participating uh, this past year. We make a little booklet where you get almost get like a passport type of thing and get your mm -hmm. stamps as you go around and people get really into it, you know, and I, that, that's kind of a more organized way, but I mean, even, even simple things such as um, I, on the night of Holy Thursday, for example, you know, making, making a little trip around to uh, various mm -hmm. parishes uh, mm -hmm. that have the blessed sacrament on display that night is its own pilgrimage. There, there's so many ways to do what you're talking about. Yeah. 
No, absolutely. Uh, for those of us out in rural Alabama, um, we, we would have to drive to get to the next parish where is 45 minutes away. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so be it definitely would be a seven hour journey with 15 minutes at each location with Jesus for your hours. Um, that you know, your be, seven that's hours, a little bit but... different experience than, uh, than what we have in the Northeast. We're a little closer together, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but so I, I kind of, uh, referenced this of upcoming, uh, seminars coming up. So when's the next one and where can people go in order to be able to register and then also to listen to the previous ones because that's what i've been doing yeah thank you um everything is available at religion to reality.org uh the uh the upcoming the next one is on monday november 11th they actually they happen every uh monday every other monday rather so the november 11th november 25th december 9th are all uh webinars um mm -hmm. and you are very welcome to join again the the next one's on growth and faith um, so how do we nurture that it's a really interesting guest, by the way, Brian Butler is, mm -hmm. uh, is, do you know him? Uh, I, I know his work because, woods, right. Mm -hmm. uh, well, kind of, Louisiana. I mean, he's in the Southeast, yeah. he's down in Louisiana. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so he, uh, so he, so his, his, uh, organization echo leads retreats. So literally what we're talking about, mm -hmm. um, Paul Fahey, uh, co-founder of third space previously of where Peter is. So really interesting blog, very yeah. interesting guy. Um, Good stuff there. On the community side, we have Scott Weeman joining us uh, from mm -hmm. Catholic in Recovery. So basically, he's mm -hmm. a, he is doing amazing work of of trying to start groups. Uh, he started not trying. He has started over I think over hundreds of groups at this point around the country that mm -hmm. apply five, uh, twelve step spirituality through mm -hmm. uh, through the sacraments and through Catholic teaching. Um, and then Andrew Whaley, uh, founder of Calix, who thinks really interestingly about like how do we use um, other spaces, you know, to invite people in, in maybe a less threatening way, to, you know, let's be honest, the mass is a complex and, and, uh, inviting someone thing. to mass is not the starting point. It's never the starting point. Exactly. So he, he's done <laughs> consulting work on like, how do we, is there a coffee shop sort of approach that we can take mm -hmm. here to get people in the door and just start to have that conversation. And then finally, generational differences in discipleship. Uh, you, many people probably are familiar with Josh Packard from his work with the Springtide Institute and the and some of the data that they have released. He's now the founder of Future of Faith. He's there to talk to us as well as uh, Rosie Shaver uh, of Catholic Campus Ministry Association. Uh, um, you know, one thing that we inter that we learned about um, generational differences is, despite being labeled as the digital generation, the youngest generations are the most hungry for in person community. And, yep. you know, I've seen that firsthand doing youth ministry work and so forth, you know, these kids, uh, taking them into you know, high schoolers, taking them into Eucharistic, uh, adoration. Part of mm -hmm. it for them is just digital detox, you know, spending time with the Lord is great, but being off your phone is really great too. Right. Um, so, so anyway, uh, a lot to come religion to reality.org. Please join us. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely get that word out and have that in the show notes for everybody. Um, you know, before we sign off, can't believe it. This is actually one of our longer conversations, uh, but it's just chock full of stuff. So I know that people will enjoy it. But um, any last words for people? Any any words of encouragement or something you want to make mention of? I'm sorry to talk your ear off, but no, I, I really appreciate the time. Religion to reality. Please, uh, please. Please uh, do us both a favor and <laughs> check out the webinar series. I appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. Well, Dave, thank you. It's always a pleasure and a joy. Um, and for everybody who's out there, know of our continued prayers for each and every one of you to continue to do whatever it takes so that together we can tell the master of death, not today. God bless.